Hello and welcome to the Merchants and Marauders instructional video. Now I'll be very honest, this is one of my all-time favourite games, so I'm very excited to be showing you how different actions work within the game and just help you understand how a turn would work. I have pimped my version out quite considerably, so a number of the components I'll be showing you today will not be the original base components. I will try and highlight them wherever possible, um, and if anyone's interested in where you can buy those components, I'll be able to discuss that on the comments in, in, in the forums. Christian Markerson is, I think, one of the very best uh, game designers. I cannot wait for Clash of Cultures, but uh, as of the 10th of January, it's still not in the UK. Curse you, Christian. So uh, hopefully my next instructional video will be that exciting new game. So uh, be on the lookout for that. So without further ado, let's go through the way we would set up uh, the board. So here we have the board set up for a game. You can see that there are a number of tokens on the board and each area is essentially going to have three things that we need to place on the board at the start. This round thing, it represents a NPC merchant, so a non-player character merchant. We have this little sort of cargo box which represents what is being demanded by that current port. And this face down tile is basically a ship upgrade in that port that we do not know uh, what it is yet. The only exception to this is the Caribbean Sea itself, which of course with no port there only has the merchant floating around. So let's just have a little look at those three parts. So if I zoom into Curacao, you'll start to see some interesting things. First up, it's worth noting that every location on the board has its own tweak of the rule. So here it says rumour rolls cost no gold, which will mean nothing to anyone yet, and galleons and frigates cost 30 gold, which hopefully is kind of obvious. Each of these things is slightly different. I'm not going to go through all of them. The player aids are very helpful in understanding their special rules. The merchants are important for, ironically, the marauders. So the marauders are going to make their victory points by going and doing daring raids against merchants and potentially other players. So these are the people you can attack if you don't want to attack your friends. Now in any given port this merchant can either be this nationality, so Dutch, or if we flip it over we see it's actually another Dutch ship. So that's a bad example. Let me pretend that this one was here. We flip it over and it's English. So we've seen this English uh, uh, ship and we can either choose to attack the English or the Dutch. We are obviously going to piss one of those people off, which is going to cause problems uh, later on down the line, but that would give us an option. If we didn't want to annoy the English, then we could uh, wait outside this port effectively and wait for a ship to leave and actually turn this one effectively into a Dutch ship. So that's going to be an important mechanic for the... Um, the merch, uh, for the marauders, and obviously they aren't going to know what, what ship they're attacking until they've successfully seen them. The merchants, on the other hand, will be more interested in this tile, which is the cargo tile. So this is telling us that Curacao is in demand with tobacco. They haven't got enough of it. They're obviously big on smoking. So if um, someone buys tobacco from another location and brings it to Curacao, not only will they get victory points, potentially, um, but they'll also get more money for that good. If the good is actually uh, supplied, we remove it from the, uh, the, the board, we grab a new tile, and you're supposed to put them in a bag, I've got a snazzy felt bag for mine, and then you can see now sugar is in demand in Curacao. Finally, this uh, tile represents a ship upgrade, they are limited, and uh, you can see it's got a cannon on it. So this effectively means if we go to Curacao and we do this special action, we will be able to buy an additional cannon for our ship. So we'll be able to improve our ship. So that is what the board is going to look at, uh, look at, look like. Sorry, um, on setup, we're going to have these different tiles uh, placed around. We'll also, you can see, we've got a glory point tracker here. 
need to place a cube of the corresponding players who are joining us in the zero point. Now, this is one of my cool pimps. Uh, I didn't like the cubes particularly. I didn't think they were very exciting. So I have a parrot for each of the pirates because you can't get much more piratical than that. So these parrots will zip up the victory point track as we uh, carry on in the game and eventually we will reach 10 and that will mean that someone has won. Over to the right you can see we've got a number of cards laid out so if I just zoom in we can see we've got cargo cards right at the top, glory cards they're sort of little bonuses for getting victory points, rumour cards which are special stories which add brilliant thematic flavour to the game event cards and finally mission cards so an event will happen every turn and missions are special one-offs that we can do to improve our chances of getting victory points gain us extra victory points one thing i haven't done on this board at present is place the two missions that you the game will start with there are always two missions on the map and effectively if you take a mission a new one will spawn so if we just look at the ones I've drawn, we have the shipping contractor, which you can see is in Old Providence. So we will put that down here. And you have Lead the Way, which is in San Juan, which we will put up here. I get, oh, hang on, no, that's Havana. Where's San Juan? Uh, it's over here. Now, this is something that, again, I've decided I didn't particularly like, so I actually have uh, made little miniature mission scrolls. I'm such a nerd. Uh, so I'll put that on there. And this on here to represent that the missions have uh, have to be taken in those places. And I've actually made a snazzy mission board, as you can see, down here. Incidentally, this is the cloth bag I'm drawing from for my tiles. That does not come with the game. Neither does this snazzy mat. I found that I've got more pleasure out of Dreadfleet's map than I have out of Dreadfleet. So I've made a little mission thing with a little seal on it. I've also laid out the money. Now you get paper money in the game. I've got, got uh, metal money. So I've got some nice gold coins and silver coins with the gold being worth five and the silver being worth one. So that is effectively the board setup. We're still away from playing the game yet as we haven't set up our players and we'll need to take a player board and talk you through each of the bits of the player board before we can begin. So here we have a player board without any setup attached to it yet. Uh, you've got spaces for your captain, these are spaces for your bounties as you attack um, sort of friendly merchants and things like that. If I attack an English merchant I'll start with one bounty which means the English will start to hunt me down. If I attack two or a second English merchant then I move up to two and so on and so forth. And uh, in addition to this this will make me more valuable. So if I get all the way up to five and then another player kills me then they'll actually be able to chop my head in literally for uh, 25 gold which is quite nice. Specialists are a thing which you'll see through special cards, missions we've already seen before, rumours are uh, my very favourite thing about the game, rumours, they're sort of very thematic storytelling, sort of, they are missions of a sort but they might not be true, you've heard them at the pub, can you trust some drunken old thought in the corner. The ship space is where we're going to put our ship, these cubes will measure our um, our actual ship stats. These three things are special weapons that we can buy and finally we've got a space for any cargo cards that we might have and indeed any gold, any money we might have. Now the rules state that you simply take the top um, captain card off the deck and that is your captain. We've slightly changed the rules in my gaming group just because a lot of us like to be and do certain things and there are certain captains who are better at, uh, at pirating and certain captains who are better at merchanting. So the way we've house ruled it is simply that you can take two captain cards but the one you don't choose will be your backup. So if you are killed then you do have to make do with the backup captain, the one that you didn't want at the start. 
So let's go through the anatomy of a captain card. Here we have Frederico de Silva. You can see he's Spanish. So if the Spanish go to war with somebody and um, there aren't any pirates about, then perhaps if we've gone to war with England, perhaps the English will start attacking us. You can see his starting location of San Juan. Now, it is quite important to know where your starting location is because you are able to bury treasure at your starting location. So I simply bought another parrot and I've just popped him on the board uh, to represent my starting location. There aren't really any tokens in the game which will, uh, which will give you that ability. Uh, I do believe the game comes with three round coloured discs in terms of cardboard just as left over. So you blue, red and I believe yellow are okay but you'd need to take a one of the white spare ones and colour it green if you uh, if you can't remember or just look at the card and know where your home port is. Uh, I have a special ability which won't mean anything to us until we go through these different stats. So the steering wheel represents our seamanship and that's primarily for fighting at sea, but it's also potentially for avoiding damage in storms. The scouting, the magnifier, uh, the telescope rather, is obviously for seeing other ships. So that could be the NPC other ships and starting to hunt them down. It could be player ships, which wouldn't be very friendly, but certainly in the nature of the game. The cutlass is your leadership, and this shows you how easy it is to hire new people, to inspire them to come on board your pirate ship, or um, used in fighting hand-to-hand. -hand. And finally, your treasure chest is your influence, which is used for things like acquiring missions, and as you can see, on my special rule, uh, actually getting rumours. Now, effectively, these numbers are dictating how many dice you're going to be able to roll for a test. So, if I was trying to do an influence check, I would be able to take two dice. And these dice are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4. So, 1, 2, 3, th one, two, three 4. And then they have two skull and crossbones on them. Uh, when you're rolling, you are looking for a skull and crossbones. So I've got two dice, each one has a 33% chance of getting me a skull and crossbones and I'm hoping to get one. And lo and behold, I have. It's about 66% chance. There's a whole uh, detailed file of the odds of beating somebody if you have X number of dice and they have X number of dice. Uh, but I don't know. I've never heard of a pirate using a spreadsheet, so it's not something I would do. So two dice for this. Obviously, if I was scouting, then I would be using four dice. So it would give me much higher odds. But ironically, it's still not guaranteed. So um, I believe I've had one game here where I rolled 25 dice in a row without a success. I did not win. So that's the idea there. You'll be called upon using these. Um, in the game and obviously you, you roll that at many dice. You also start with a glory card. Glory cards are basically awarded to you every time you gain a glory point. And remember, 10 glory is going to win you the game. Why do they have extra benefits then if you're already winning? Well, the first five or any five of your glory can come from money. So 10 money will actually gain you a glory point. But obviously, it's a lot easier to get money than it is to get daring raids or amazing trades or whatever. So this is trying to encourage people to do more stuff rather than hoard money. Money's still going to be a big thing in the game, and as soon as one person gets to that 5 Veep point, they could win if they can get enough money, but these just try and even it up a bit. So this is the glory card I've started with. This is actually quite an interesting one. You can see it's a ship's surgeon specialist. So, you can see that again, it's asked me to do something. So succeed a leadership role, or pay two gold if that fails, and then keep this, far, uh, this card face up. And what this allows me to do is when I would normally take damage on my crew, I might actually be able to save them because I'll have a surgeon. So I have to go to Curacao to play this card, and then when I do, if I pay my two gold or if I succeed my leadership, he will actually stay on my board 
as a specialist. So if I zoom out, you can see now I've got a specialist. And you're allowed um, one of each specialist. So there's a lookout and there's different things like that. So they're quite rare. You, know, you don't always get them. It's unlikely you're going to get more than one specialist out in a game, I would say. But that's where your specialist goes. The final choice for you in this setup phase is to take a flute or a sloop. So the flute is the trader's ship, essentially. These are the, uh, the ships from the game, but I have painted them. Well, actually, my friend has painted them. I shouldn't take his uh, credit for his, his hard work. And um, so we've got the flute, which is a bigger ship, and we've got the sloop. And I think the models are really lovely. If I uh, put them on the side, you can see just how lovely they are. So you've got a really nice little uh, sloop there. The flute, if I just sort of show you. He's got a little blue thingy on him because he's blue. And uh, it's at this point you really need to start deciding whether or not you want to be a pirate. The flute, as you can see from the stats, has a toughness of three, so it's quite hard. Nice big cargo. And uh, a cargo of four is going to be important for merchants because in order to get a glory point for merchants, you're going to need three of any goods um, that are in demand. So uh, you need a cargo bigger than three, uh, bigger than two rather. One crew, not very uh, safe if he gets boarded. One cannon and two manoeuvrability. So it's a bit unwieldy, a bit slow. The sloop, on the other hand, has a toughness of two, so not as tough. Uh, a cargo of only two, so it would be a very, very poor choice for you to choose the sloop if you wanted to be a merchant, because you are effectively denying the, yourself the ability to get three of a kind, and therefore get any glory points. Two crew bit more robust on crew but still not amazing one cannon they both only start with one cannon because that would be too powerful otherwise but this is the big difference for maneuverability when you try and attack a merchant they're probably going to run away and how much maneuverability you have will determine whether they are successful or not so when you're choosing you do need to be mindful of your captain because it can be a dumb decision. You can be forced into one part. Well, not forced. You can always go the other route if you want to. But it can be make more sense for you to be a merchant or a marauder. Um, the thing you're looking for for pirating is generally the telescope and the steering wheel. So he's got masses of scouting. He can be able to see everyone, but he doesn't have a great steering wheel. So he doesn't have great seamanship. He might not be that good at um, avoiding damage when fighting these people. Um, generally, the merchants will have a very high uh, influence action because that means they can get missions much, much easier and rumours, which is what they sort of trade in as well. And they will normally have a special ability which will lend themselves to merchanting. So they might have an extra cargo space or they might have something like that. So there's, uh, there's sort of some uh, pirates which do lend themselves to, to one or the other. Um, to be honest, a lot of them lend themselves to both and it's down to personal preference. I'm obviously going to be a pirate, so uh, away with the flute and then we'll go and look at how we set up our board for our sloop. So here you can see you've got these cubes to measure where everything is and we've got a toughness first of two. So toughness is measured in two locations on this board, the hull space and the masts space. So we've got two hits before we sink, as it were, on each of those spaces. If your hull is ever reduced to zero, incidentally, then you sink and die, and you have to start again. So it can be quite punitive. Uh, the crew, sorry, the cargo is two, the crew is additionally two, and the cannons are one. We're almost done. We've set up our ship, and that's what our ship will look like. We've not got our specialist, I should take that off. We've got this as a face down glory card, uh, and we, we can get our specialist later on. The only thing we need to do left is to take some starting money. So I've got my gold coins there, so five each. You start with 10 money. You also, I did mention it before, get a treasure chest. So our treasure chest, now this is again one of my pimped out components. Treasure chest is where we can bury treasure. 
so we can put our money into our treasure chest uh, for free, basically, whenever we do a port action in our home port, and it's safe, so if anyone sinks me now, I still have my 10 money, and actually my new captain will start with that money, he's got a map to your treasure chest, um, but obviously we don't want to do that now, because we want to use that money to buy things. So that's how you set up your board, and uh, from there we simply place our little sloop ship on our starting port, and we can begin the game. So if we just zoom up to here, we'll see that my sloop is now on San Juan's port. So, that's how we set up our player boards. Okay, normally the start of a round would begin with an event. An event is something which will change up the game slightly. 50% of the events are new big NPC ships coming in and the other 50% things like plague or storms and stuff like that. But given that this is the first turn we don't need to take an event. And the turns are quite simple however there is one action that can take a long time and that will mean that the game slows down ever so slightly when you take that action. Essentially you have three things you can do in a turn. You're allowed to do three things. The first is move. So if I wanted to move it would cost me one to leave port and move into the San Juan sea space. It might cost me two to then move across that sort of greyed out line and if I wanted to and I wanted to dock in Santo Domingo it would cost me a third move to end up in Santo Domingo. It's not a very interesting go if you just moved like that and um, it's basically sometimes I've seen merchant players do it because you cannot be attacked in a port. So that is the first action uh, you can do it up to three times is to move. And just remember it costs one movement to leave port and one movement to enter port. So, the second action is to scout and hunt. So, it could be a player or it could be a, a, a merchant ship as we have here. The rules are different for the merchant ships than they are to the players. I would say ship to ship player combat is the most complicated element of the game and we'll come to it last. So, let's say I'm a pirate and I want to attack this merchant. So first I leave port for one move. Then I need to scout. Now I've already seen that my scouting guy, uh, my scouting skill is four. So I'm going to be able to roll four dice and I'm going to roll them at the top. Oh, I've knocked my ship over, but boy howdy have I been successful. I have one, two, three successes. That means nothing. <laughs> okay, one is all I needed, uh, but that's still good. And it means I can flip this tile over. I do not have to attack them if I don't want to. So you can see we've run into a French merchant, and now it's a choice. You can either let the guy sail away and he will move up to the merchant space and he's gone from the game until eight or oh, seven more merchants and eight total of eight um, are attacked or whatever i could choose to attack the french this would mean that i am not allowed in any port that is french so that's going to restrict where i can go it will also mean i'm a pirate so it means that the French will actively hunt me down, and indeed any naval ship will hunt me down if they are, there isn't someone who they hate more. So if I have a French bounty and someone has a Dutch bounty, then the Dutch naval ship will choose them over me, but if they don't have any bounties, then they will choose me over, over not attacking anyone which is understandable. The only time it isn't understandable is when the French and the Dutch are at war and you've just killed a French ship and the Dutch guy still tries to kill you, which can be quite depressing. 
you were always allowed to effectively change the nationality of the ship to the one in the current space. So if I wanted to, I could change that into a Spanish ship. It's not me attacking the port, it's essentially me waiting outside of port for a Spanish ship to come along and, and then I can shoot them. Now I am obviously Spanish. Now we've already said you can only bury treasure in your home port so you might be thinking that would be a very bad move for me to attack the Spanish. But please be aware you can always move back into your home port regardless of whether you're hated by, uh, by that country or not. And the Spanish are pretty good. In fact if you read the rule here the merchant raid gives me plus three plunder when raiding a Spanish merchant. So even though I am Spanish, I'm going to turn on my Spanish compatriots and pretend that this ship is a Spanish one. So, we've scouted successfully. You roll the dice, if you get a skull and crossbones, you have successfully seen that ship. Now let's move on to the attack phase, or the raiding phase. So for the raiding phase, you need to take some cargo cards. These cargo cards are used both for trade, both for cargo and for fighting. And effectively, the very first thing you do is you flip over three cards. Okay. Now, in order to gain a victory point, and remember we want victory points more than anything, in order to gain a victory point, you need this gold number to add up to 12. So at the currently we have 3, we have 6 and we have uh, 2. And please be aware that the top part of this card is effectively meaningless at this stage of the um, of the fight. Okay, It is only the bottom numbers and these two are unique. So this is not two escapes, this is two gold and the ship trying to escape. So what this is telling me is that there's two attempts at escape. If their number of escapes ever equals my maneuverability, then they have got away. So just taking my sloop card, you can see I'm actually able to get a maneuverability of four, so I'm actually allowed to have an additional escape. Now, we're aiming for 12, but because we're in San Juan, we get plus three to it, so actually we only need nine. And this is very upsetting for us, of course, because we actually have eight. So uh, we're one short, which is very annoying. All is not lost. We do get to test our seamanship, and that can mean that we modify it. And this is why seamanship, that steering wheel, is quite important as well. So we've actually rolled a three and a one. Let's pretend that we've rolled a success. So, you roll the number of dice equal to seamanship, and I've rolled a success and a one. Now, one success allows me to do one thing, essentially. I can either remove a card completely, or I can replace a card with a new card, or I can draw a card. Now. At the moment, I have two escapes, which is fine. I can, I can take another escape, and I have a hit to hull. Now, remember my toughness is two, so that hit to hull will push me down to one toughness. Uh, yeah, one toughness, one hull. So, if I take this card, and it's another hit to hull, they've actually sunk me. I'm the worst pirate in the game, and I immediately die. If it's a hit to cannons, remember I only have one cannons, if they ever reduce you to zero in any, uh, any area, then the raid has automatically failed. So if this was a hit to cannons, then uh, this would also auto fail. So the hull would be worse because it would kill me, because with no hull you don't have a ship, uh, but the cannons would also be bad. So now it's very, very hard for me to say, I've got 11 gold here, which is nice. Um, do I risk it? But, of course, pirates do not uh, suffer fools gladly. So, I take my extra card, and lo and behold, it is a hit to cannons. So, that means that I have failed the mission. 
I will go over to my player board and I will push down my hull by one because they hit me on the hull and my cannons by zero. In addition to this I will take a Spanish bounty because I've attacked Fair Spain and uh, that of course means that they're angry with me. So a Spanish bounty is now there. If anyone kills me, and to be honest I'm looking like a pretty easy target at this point, um, they will be able to sell my head for five gold. So that's really bad, isn't it? That would have been really sad. I would have been pretty grumpy at that point if this had been my first play. There is one way you can improve your dice roll. We said that this was your roll. What you can do before you've taken this card is that you can spend one of your special weapons. We'll detail how you buy a special weapon later on, but effectively you have chain shot, grape shot, and grappling hook. And they all do the same thing when you are dealing with a merchant raid. They turn a fail into a success. So let's rewind what we did and say, I actually did have some special weapons. And therefore, when I rolled my one success, that was fine. But I also got to use my special weapon. And it doesn't matter which one I use. So let's say it was grape shot to turn my one into a success as well. Now, for my first success, we've already said I drew a card. And for my second success, I am obviously going to want to get rid of the hit to cannons. But again, do I push my luck? I'm so close to, the, uh, to that golden 12 figure. Uh, which would give me that victory point. It would give me 12 gold, which actually 10 gold is a victory point as well, although it's not uh, measured on the glory tracker. So that would actually get me two victory points. But no, I, I've already realized that I've pushed my luck too far. So with my second success, rather than replace this, I certainly wouldn't want another one. Rather than replace this, I will remove it from the, uh, from the fight. So in that case, I only took one hit to my hull. I didn't take a hit to cannons. Okay. Incidentally, you can see here, this is where the special weapons are situated on your board. Okay, so I've taken my one hit to hull, and I haven't taken my hit to cannons. I have two cargo spaces, and none of the cargo was... Um, none of the cargo uh, spaces were hit. Incidentally, should we just see if I would have taken the hit to cannons? Oof! Isn't it lucky I, I, I didn't take that, because that would have been sad. So, I have two cargo. The very first thing that happens is that I get 12 money. I get the 2 plus the... Oh, sorry, 11 money. Uh, the 2 plus the 3 plus the 3. And we remember the special rule for my location, which gives me an extra 3. So, I'm already 12 money up. Okay, and uh, I will put that into my kitty. And I actually will also get to take two cards. Now, it's not very interesting, a choice for me, because they're all Coco. So I have to take the Coco. And uh, that is what I will do. This then goes and will be shuffled into the deck later on. Shuffling is crucial because this is set building and you're trying to get three of a kind in certain places. As you can see there, I pulled out Coco, Coco, Coco from a prior game. So let's just have a little look at my board now. You can see I still have my bounty because I did attack a Spanish ship and uh, that's not going to change. Even if you fail, you still have your bounty. Uh, my hull has gone down one. I have my two Coco obscuring my decent chunk of money. I have 21 money now. So uh, they will go on top, just trying to hide exactly uh, what my amount of money I have. So moving back up to the main board, we now take this French merchant because I have now, well, it was a Spanish merchant when I attacked him, uh, but we'll take the merchant and we place it on this merchant space. What that means is that merchant has retreated and uh, the tale of high piracy has put a merchant off coming back to San Juan. So until another seven more merchants are taken off the board, 
um, we will not get any more back. And upon the eighth merchant uh, being taken off, all eight come back and the whole board is repopulated. This makes for a really nice mechanic where you are forced into areas you might not want to go, such as next to a naval ship, um, as, as you are basically going to uh, need to go there to do your raids. So, it was one move to go out. I have now done my raid successfully, so I have one more action. I might as well go down to Curacao. I mean, I could look on the board, because is there any cocoa in demand anywhere? There is some up in Nassau, but I'm not that interested in it. Curacao's cool. It gives me some free rumours, which we'll see makes an important uh, thing in just a second. And uh, it also is where my glory card is based. So let's move for my last go. So remember, we get three actions, one out, two attack, and three into the Caribbean Sea. It's important to note that with a scouting action, I was lucky and I rolled my dice and I was successful. If I had failed to scout that ship properly, so if I had rolled and missed, I cannot re-roll. You don't get to go again. You can move to a second space and roll again, but you cannot re-scout a ship that you failed to see. So that's the end of the turn, and now we can draw... Uh, so we've all had a go, let's pretend. So let's say that the red player has also had a go. And it's on this point that we draw our event card. So we draw an event card. And as you can see here, it's Plague. So the top bit is for the ships to come out. And it says, randomly draw four of the unused demand tokens. Ports with a matching good cannot be entered this turn. If only we'd gotten our ship right out uh, sorry our surgeon out earlier then uh, that would be a pro uh, wouldn't be a problem for us so our first one is textiles so no textiles ports can be entered so if we just zoom in that means we cannot go into petit guave okay because there's textiles there the next one is coco so it's lucky we didn't go to uh, Nassau because we wouldn't be able to go into that port the next one is tobacco, uh, so it's sugar we don't want to draw because Curacao has sugar in it. And the final one is rum, so we're okay. Those are the four that have come out and that means that we're not going to struggle too badly. So that was the event. Sometimes ships come out, if I just show you a ship, and you noticed at the top of that, these uh, these events, they would have meant that these pirates would have moved south, the Spanish would have moved east, and the Dutch would have moved west. Although they will ignore those rules if, uh, if you are a pirate nearby. So sometimes ships will come out, um, maybe we'll see one in the next event phase. Okay, so first up, it's our go again. We've got three actions, and we haven't seen one of the most important ones. I've got loads of plunder, so for my first action I will move to Curacao. My second action, I will port at Curacao. And then my third action, I will do a port action. Now, a port action is very laborious, so we're going to have to devote a whole section to it. So, the first thing you have to do in a port action is decide whether or not you want to sell your goods. I have two cocoa. If the good is in demand, you can sell it for six money each, so this would be 12. If the good is not in demand, you can sell it for three money each. If we go up and have a look at Curacao, you will see that sugar the sugar token in demand there and therefore uh, I will only get three money for each of these tiles or these cards however I want the cargo space to be free so I will sell both of those and I will get six money for the privilege that is the only action you have to do first the rest of the actions can be done in any order so we could go and visit the, the cargo place and buy some more cargo. Now, again, I've changed the rules here. I've only ever played it this way. So the rules state you take six cargo cards and you look at them. Now, I don't find that that's particularly uh, 
it slows the game down and uh, the idea is is that people will not know where you're going next which makes sense so if i'm getting tobacco you might not know i'm also getting tobacco which is going to make things easy for you however in some ways i don't think that that is that useful so i prefer to just deal the six cards out and this way it helps for new players because sometimes they don't fully understand what's going on it uh, also means that they, no one can cheat. As you'll see, if we have multiples of things going out, then it will be uh, cheaper for us. So I could just lie and say, oh, I've got three of this or five of these. I'll pay five for all of the tiles or all of the cards. So you can see here we've got spices, spices, textiles, rum, and tobacco. Oh, and sugar. Now, sugar is in demand. We cannot have sugar. Uh, available in this port so we put it away and replace it with a new card you can never buy the good that is in demand in that port and lo and behold it's more spices the prices operate in a sort of volume discount basis I'm just going to make a very slight alteration uh, just so it makes the volume aspect clearer. So let's say instead of a rum, I drew a ta uh, an additional textile. So for any good which you have one of visible, so we have one tobacco, then that will cost you three gold. And you'll remember, if I sell it in a port where people don't want it, it will only get me three gold. So it's not actually necessarily the best move, because you're actually not going to make any money out of it at all unless you sell it in a place which is uh, in demand. If we have two of a kind, each card will cost two. So this one costs three to buy on its own. These two will cost two each or four in total. And again, remember, we can sell them for six if they're demand in demand. So if I hadn't just pissed the French off, I could take these up to Petit Guave and we'd be able to sell them for 12 money, which would be quite nice for a price of four. So I'm at eight profit. If you have three of a kind, this is what you're looking for, really. Three of a kind is awesome. So three of a kind means that they cost one each. One, two, three. So it cost me three for all of these. Okay, so it's actually the same price as the one good you've got for tobacco. In addition, if you sell three goods in demand, then not only do you get 18 money, so effectively I've made 15 profit here. Remember, 10 gold is a victory point as well. I will also get a glory point for uh, supplying the desperate people of Santo Domingo with the spices they so sorely needed. Now, I'm a pirate, so this is all a much of a muchness. I only have two cargo space anyway, um, so I'm not going to buy anything. Because, to be honest, I need that cargo space to fill up on delicious plunder from the various uh, people uh, that I'm going to raid. So it's not generally a very good idea to fill up um, goods if you're a pirate, because you're going to steal goods from your poor, innocent merchant ships. So that's the fir the first action was the selling. You have to sell if you want to. There's no obligation to sell, but you cannot look at what's available for sale and then proceed to sell afterwards. Then we had the purchase. The next one is to visit the shipyard. Now, the shipyard lets you do a number of things. First up, it lets you repair your ship. And my ship has two, sorry, one hull damage. So to improve my hull back up to its original amount, and that's all I can ever do, I can't over overbuild, it's going to cost me the two gold, which ironically in my pimp version is silver. So two silver, which I'm going to use to repair my hull up to top whack. You'll also remember we used one of those special weapons earlier, the chain shot, the target, uh, the grape shot, and the grappling hook. Now it's really important to note the explanation underneath. This target masts, target crew, and reroll seamanship does not apply to merchant raids. They simply turn failed rolls into successes. If I want to buy one of these, it will cost me three. So if I wanted to buy all three of them, and to be honest, it's a very good shout, 
then that's going to cost me nine money. So you can see that you can make a lot of money as a pirate, but if you have to use one of those special weapons, it's actually going to cost you three money just to uh, just to actually um, buy the weapon uh, to use. The final thing that we need to do in the shipyard is to see what cool goodie lies at that port. And it's always worth turning this one over. You don't have to buy it, but it's interesting. So again, we flip it over. It's the cannons upgrade. So this is a ship modification. Again, this costs three money. Um, so it costs quite a lot of money, but it does give you an extra cannons. So we definitely want this. Cannons is, in my opinion, the best thing in the game. So one of the best upgrades in the game. So what we do is we pay three money to that for that. And we go down, let me just zoom out ever so slightly, we go down and we place it on our upgrade tile. So I'll just move this across. Okay, you can see the cannon port has now been filled. So there are two, I believe, of every single upgrade. We cannot now buy another cannon port, but that does bump our cannons up to two. And you remember in that first fight, we had that thing, a hit to cannons, meant that we automatically failed it. Well now, we aren't going to fail because a hit to cannons will just reduce us to one cannon and then we can, uh, we can carry on. The final thing you can do at the shipyard is to buy a new ship. And the two ships that you can buy at the shipyard or that you'd want to buy are the galleon ship and the frigate. You basically want a frigate, in my opinion. Although, to be honest, I don't win very often. So, uh, <laughs> what do I know? And they also come with their own models. And the models are really gorgeous. So, uh, I'll just get these little models out. So, here's our, our galleon. So, we've got the galleon there. And that does come with the game. Obviously not painted, though. And uh, this is the frigate. So, we've got a cool, snazzy frigate. Now... These normally cost 35 money, but you'll remember in Curacao they only cost tw uh, 30, so they're, they're at a minus 5 cost. You also currently have a ship, so if you look at the player raid, it will tell you how much you can sell your current ship for. So a sloop can be sold for 5 money. So effectively, what that means is in most ports, these are going to cost you 30 because it's 35 minus the 5 however in this port then it's going to cost you 25 money so it's actually quite cheap if you've got any of these upgrades then you actually add one to the resale price of your ship so because I've got that on my sloop that actually means that I will get six money for my sloop so it will only cost me 24 as you can see here, I have 14, so I do not, oh no, I think that's a gold one in this light look silver. So I have 18, I still don't have enough money to buy either of these for now. Which makes sense, because uh, we probably shouldn't be able to buy them on our very, uh, well, our second turn in the game. So, that is the shipyard part of the port action. Every single bit of this is doable, all for the one port action. So that wasn't me taking more than one go. We're still only part way through my port action. Um, and uh, we've still got a little bit left to do. Okay, so we've done the cargo. We've sold our cargo, which we had to do first. We've bought new cargo. We've visited the shipyard. Now we can go down the pub. If you'd taken damage to your crew, then you wouldn't be able to heal your crew at the shipyard because uh, that's not really what shipyards do so you go to the pub and you would roll your leadership remember that's your cutlass so you roll the two dice and you're looking for again a single success okay so one of the dice has fallen on the floor let me get another one very good at rolling dice on the floor at the moment uh, so I have failed my leadership roll if you are successful, 
and it only needs one success, you can bump your crew up for free. If you are not successful, then they look at you and say, oh Chris, you're a bit of a shady character, don't really trust you, and you have to pay two for each pip that you go up. So that's going to cost me, unfortunately, another four money. Okay, obviously I didn't actually take the damage to the crew, but it would have cost me four money to do. This would be the phase that I would be able to actually try and get my specialist. And remember it says succeed a leadership role. So again, I roll my leadership. And again, this is standard for the course. I never roll successes. So luckily these things don't punish you too hardly, harshly. If you fail, you just pay two money for him. So I pay my two money. So I'm burning through my money at a rate of knots. I'm back down to 12 money at this point. Um, and that is my... Um, that is my recruitment phase. But we're not done with the pub yet. In the corner of the pub is an old, salty old dog with, a, a, with one wooden leg. And he's, uh, he's deep in his cups. And he's muttering to himself. So we, we could go over, we'll buy him a drink, and we'll see if we can make any sense from him. So this is us getting a rumour. And we need to roll on our influence. Okay, normally this would cost two money as well, but we're in Curacao, and Curacao has rumours for free. And uh, as usual, I still roll a failure. Uh, if you roll a failure, then you do not get a re-roll. You don't get to pay extra for a rumour, you just haven't found one. And uh, in any other place but Curacao, you'll have lost the two money that you spent. You bought him a drink, and he passed out, and that's that. But I, because of my special character, get to uh, re-roll again. Oh, you can't even see the other one, but it is actually t a double success. So, after buying him a drink, he uh, he leans over the table and starts telling me of a great story. Okay, so I'm going to take a rumour card. Now, normally, you're only allowed one of these. Uh, actually, I'm allowed two rumours. So I'm using uh, a rather unique character here. But never mind. So let's see what the uh, rumour is. And I absolutely love the rumours. My favourite is the White Lady. She gives you a free frigate. We've already seen that they cost loads of money. But it's a, it's a wreck. So it's got nothing. So Donaldo can smuggle anything into anywhere. His last known port was Caracas. So this is what we have to do. In Caracas, we will have to make a port action. And we will need to test our, I believe, we will need to test our influence. It's, uh, some of these have um, errors. So it looks like we have to test influence. So we get to Caracas and we see if the rumour is true. This is a drunk man, remember. He's not very trustworthy. He's a bit of a pisshead. If we're successful, then this guy joins us as a specialist. And that means that when we sell goods, we can roll our influence and earn an extra gold because we're smuggling in something dodgy. So he would go up into our specialist bit if we were successful. What's important is if you're successful with a rumour, then you actually also get a glory point. Okay, and I forgot to mention it before, but if you buy a big ship, then you get a glory point there. So we'll have a little summary at the end of how you can move up the glory point tracker. Now, what other sort of rumours are there? You'll notice that this one's quite a good illustration. I have just pissed the Spanish off. I've just attacked a Spanish ship, and Sp uh, Caracas is Spanish. So um, that means that... Uh, in that case, I, I would never be able to do that rumour. They won't let me into the port unless I'm lucky and I get some sort of reprieve. And there are some events that let you get reprieves and stuff like that. So let's just take another example. This one is an example with an error, I believe, on the card. So Indian treasure. And you, you can't not love these. I mean, golden Indian artefacts are said to be hidden on a small island near Kartenga. Now, this has got the treasure chest on it. So it's saying that we need to do an influence action, but then next to it, it says it's in the Cartenga Sea Zone. Cartenga is actually another Spanish port, but luckily I don't have to go in there, okay, to actually do this one. And it says a scout action, so this should actually be a uh, telescope, not a, a treasure chest. If successful, you find the island and it's 15 gold guarded by two crew with a leadership of one. 
fight them in crew combat. If you lose, your captain is killed. And I believe last time we played this, my friend got this, and he had a, a leadership three captain, which means he gets three dice to this, these people's one dice, and then he died. He was very upset about it, we all thought it was hilarious. So, if you find the, uh, the island with a scout action, and then you proceed to capture the gold, kill the people off, you get one glory point for proving the rumour to be true, and you get 15 gold, remembering that 10 gold buried in your treasure chest counts as one of your glories, but it's hidden. So, a good way to get um, glory points, and really fun. They're all really awesome, so they're all really good. So, we've been to the pub, we've been to the shipyard, and we've been to the, uh, the, the cargo, the marketplace, if you like. The only other place we can go to, and we actually can't go to it on this particular space, is the governor's uh, house, and we can get a mission. So, we've only actually got missions in Old Providence and in San Juan, but they literally are just extra requirements, and... Uh, it's normally another influence, and again, there, there are extra things you can do. So if we just zoom in on, this is San Juan's one. It's not particularly exciting, uh, but this is the San Juan mission. If you complete a mission, again, you get the reward and you get a victory point. So it tells you how much the, uh, the, the money we get is. So we earn 10 gold, which counts as almost like a... Uh, uh, another victory point. The requirement is no Spanish bounty, so unfortunately I would not be able to do this one thanks to just killing a Spanish ship. Uh, given the, give this mission and find a pirate of your choice through seamanship, a player pirate of your choice through scouting. This completes the mission. The pirate is then engaged by the Spanish naval ship if it is in play. If not, you must fight. So... <laughs> I was playing with a very lovely family and their son is hyper aggressive <laughs> when it comes to this game and the Spanish were at war so there was a Spanish man o' war out which is the most powerful ship in the game and his dad was in a little sloop and he picked this mission up and uh, went across to his dad and scouted his dad and uh, brought the Spanish navy running which was cool until his dad, through incredible dice rolls, boarded the uh, ship, butchered the crew, and then got a victory point for defeating a big ship and got the most powerful ship in the game. And his son was absolutely distraught by that, which was hilarious. So that is one port action, what we've just done there. Okay, so just to clarify, the port action will be sell your goods first you have to if you want to sell you have to sell at that point you can then look at the cargo it should be face down but personally i would play it face up just because it makes the game quicker and a bit more transparent should we say visit the shipyard where you can repair buy special weapons buy a ship upgrade or buy a new ship visit the pub where you can recruit new crew and find a rumor and if there is a mission in the space, visit the mission and, and get a mission. And normally, the missions require an influence check as well. So normally, there is some sort of test in order to get the mission. At the end of the round, again, you will get an event. The only event I would quite like to show you, which we haven't really seen yet, is when a ship comes out. So I'm just trying to find one. They're about 50-50. So this would be a good example. Okay, so a French naval ship, Admiral Pierre Le Montoyne, or whatever his name is. So place the French frigate in the bas, uh, sea zone of Basse-Terre. Okay, if there is already a French ship out, you just move it to Basse-Terre. So at the end of this round, a Basse-Terre ship is coming out. Uh, or a French ship is coming out. You are given little markers to represent the ships that are coming out and then when it does come out a frigate or a man of war actually will come onto the board so it's at that point so first we place it the ship is arriving at the end of the turn which means as a pirate i can move through this space in this current turn but i don't want to be here really and i don't want to be in any adjacent space to it really 
at the end of the turn the ship will come out. And that's because these are all brown ships in the game and it's hard to distinguish which ship is which. Um, I've, well, again, my friend has painted them, uh, so I've got the ship and generally when it comes out I put it to the side and then when it uh, arrives I flick it up like that. And uh, that's the, the French, actually that's the French Man of War. Uh, so there are two types of ship. Uh, the French frigate is when we're at times of peace. And it has the stats of a frigate. And you've just seen the French Man of War, which is when the French are at war. You cannot buy the Man of War. You can only um, capture it from another well, from a French NPC or whatever. So you can see there, we've got some snazzy decals on the sails and stuff like that. Now, when events come out later on, this will move the ship around. So, uh, if I was to show you, unfortunately now I can't find one which moves a French ship. So if we took this tough on crime card, that was the event, you can see that the French ship would move west. So it's going to move into there and that would be how it moves. However, if I, the evil dastardly pirate, pirate Chris Von Awesome, was up in San Juan again, uh, okay. Remember, I have a Spanish bounty. I chose not to attack the French, uh, but that doesn't really matter, okay. So, uh, unless there was someone who had a French bounty, it's irrelevant. I'm still a pirate in the eyes of the law. So even though this card just told us to move the ship west, the ship would move up here and then would attempt to scout me. Okay, so the ship would then attempt to scout me and uh, let's just zoom in up here. You can see he has a scout of flag slash three. So that's the number of French bounties I believe that I have, which is none, or three. So appreciate, if I have five French bounties, he would be much more aggressive, shall we say, in trying to find me. So then he does a scouting action and attempts to attack. And let's just roll this out and see what happens. Lo and behold, he has seen me. So this actually moves quite nicely onto the last mechanic of the game, which we haven't really dealt with, and that is fighting. So I've moved my player board slightly here just to try and illustrate how this fight would work. He spotted me. This is the most complicated part of the game. As soon as someone spots you, be it another player or the NPC, you have a battle. And if it had moved on to my turn when I moved off, he would have scouted for me then. Um, so he spotted me and now we have a battle. Now you can see I have two seamanship. Uh, I'm good at spotting people. I'm not very good at fighting. This guy actually has three seamanship and three cutlasses. So I'm outmanned and outgunned. Um, in order to set up the enemy, normally you would, if you're fighting player on player, you would just look at each other's boards. But if you uh, have an NPC, you use this bit at the top. So we've got the, uh, the hull and uh, the cargo and the masts and all of that. So the very first thing that happens is both of us have to shoot. On your turn, you can shoot, you can board, or you can try and run away. Running away is very hard in this game, but we'll see how it goes. The only uh, exception to that rule is on the very first turn, you have, to, uh, you have to shoot. So how do we do it? We first test the number of steering wheels and the person with the most successes will shoot. So, Captain Von Frenchy has gone and got one success and five pips. Chris has got one success and three pips. So, this is very bad for me. The player who is successful fires with all three cannon. The player who is unsuccessful fires cannon equal to the number of successes rolled. So he rolled one success, but because he won the battle, he gets to fire with all of his cannons, which is three. 
I have two cannons, but because I only rolled one success, I only get to fire with two. So, he's got three cannon dice, so we roll three dice, and these are the bits of the ship he's hit. He's hit four, he's hit three, and he's hit one. One's good, cargo's useless in a fight. Crew's bad, because it's going to mean that it's harder if we board, and cannons is very bad. Now, if that had knocked me down to zero cannons, I still would have been able to fire this turn because it is deemed that I have uh, fired simultaneously. So I get to roll one dice because I only have one success and I've hit one, uh, which is cargo. This is where some of our special abilities come in place with these special weapons. You'll notice there is no skull and crossbones on the ship. If I had rolled a skull and crossbones, then the player controlling this, this ship would be allowed to assign the damage as they see fit. And ironically, he probably would have put it on cargo, because that's the weakest of all of them. If I spent money, or this uh, special weapon, that would let me put that damage on masts instead. If alternatively, I'd spent grape shot, that would let me put my damage on crew. So just to go through, if your cannons reach zero, then you cannot fire, which is obviously bad. If your crew reaches zero, if they board you after that, you are instantly killed. If your masts reach zero, then you can only ever roll one dice when you're doing your seamanship. So if I manage to reduce his mast to zero, even though he has three seamanship, I would only be able to roll one dice. If your cargo reaches zero, nothing happens. And if your hull reaches zero, you are sunk. You generally don't want to sink ships because if you can capture them, you will be able to potentially take the ship over uh, or you might be able to uh, do something else. So you might be able to chop the guy's head off. So if someone attacked me with my bounty uh, and sunk me, they have no proof that I was there when uh, when the ship went down and therefore they would not be able to claim my bounty. So that's the first round. Okay. Second round, you are allowed to choose what you do. So this guy is going to choose to shoot me and I am going to choose to run away. So we roll dice. Oh, he's rolled no successes. And I've rolled no successes. How upsetting. So, in this case, neither of us were successful, so the round is uh, null and void. In order to run away, you need to win. So, uh, let's just rejig this slightly. Let's just say this was the roll. So, I have rolled two successes in my attempt at running away. He has rolled one success. I have won, or so it would seem. Um, in this scenario, you need to win to run away. He is not allowed any successes. So the fact that he's had one success means that it's a draw again. It's very hard to run away. Okay, so the next round. This time, because I need to show you it, not because it's a good idea, I'm going to attempt to board. So I roll my dice. I've got one success. He rolls his dice and he's got no successes. He's rolling like I normally roll. Again, if he had one, uh, say he had a, a success like this, I could spend my grappling hook, which would allow me to re-roll seamanship. So this is where the special text comes in. You can only use the grappling hook to re-roll seamanship on a boarding action, because obviously you're trying to board with the hook. You cannot use it for shooting, for example. So I have successfully boarded him because he had no successes. And now we move to crew combat. So, this is a bit more brutal. Uh, you literally roll your cutlasses. And for every skull and crossbones you get, you do a damage to crew. So I need to roll two skull and crossbones this round and him roll none. And then I need him to roll none and I need to roll at least one. It's not likely because I only have a skull and crossbones of two. Oh, sorry, uh, cutlass of two and uh, he has a cutlass oh he only has a cutlass of two so it's marginally more likely that I'll live so this is my roll 
Ooh, a brutal roll for me there. And just as good a roll for him. <laughs> so, I take his crew down to zero. Or down to one, sorry. He takes my crew down to zero, and I am slain. If you're dead, your ship goes, your captain goes, your glory card goes, and your money goes, and you start again. You start with a new ship, and uh, all of that. If wonders had never ceased, and if I had uh, I had defeated him, so now we're on two and one, and we went again, and sure enough, I rolled a success, and sure enough, he rolled nothing. I have reduced his crew to zero. Then, lots of cool stuff happens. First up, I can take his ship, which is pretty awesome, because uh, uh, his ship's much better than mine, and because I boarded it without shooting it up, uh, the only thing which would be rubbish is the crew, so I would have still had one crew. So I would have taken this card and taken my frigate and put that there, and then I'd have moved my hull up to three, because I'm using this hull, and my cargo to three, so I'm using this cargo, my masts to three, uh, my crew is one, that's the only thing I transfer, and my cannons to three. This upgrade, unfortunately, is gone, and is replaced back on one of the empty spaces, and these are transferred over to my new ship so I keep them and I obviously keep my money. In addition to that I'll get a French bounty because I have just sunk one of the French navy ships but I also get tons and tons of goodies. So once I've got the ship I will get three cargo cards and I will get the gold on those cards. So I'll get five, three, and three so I'll get 11 gold and then I will be able to keep the cards minus each time I hit cargo so if I'd hit cargo twice I'd have had to discard two and keep one of them but actually I didn't at all so I'll get the 11 money and I will get the three cargo so I've got a brand new ship 11 money three cargo and I've just taken down one of the, the, the king's own men, or whatever the thing is in France. I've just taken down someone really cool, so I would have got uh, a victory point for that. So it's at this point I'll sign off. I've shown you elements of every single bit of the game. I had to move this board forward so we could uh, see it all. In terms of thoughts, I just think this is just one of the very best games you can buy. It's dripping in theme, it's really thematically sensible, all of the things that you've got to do. It has dice in it, and some people hate dice, but bar humbug is all I'll say to that. Dice are fun, okay, they add randomness. Uh, it's maybe not a game which you're going to love if you like randomness. It's a really, really clever, tight game. I'd like to see more ships, if I'm honest, and more rumours, and more of everything, really. Um, but... As a game, it's really, really spectacular. So that was my instructional video for Merchants and Marauders. Just before I sign off, I realised I never really went into what gets you a glory point. So be happy, a merchant raid where you get 12 gold gets you a glory point. Selling three goods of, uh, a, three goods of a kind which are in demand gets you a glory point. Completing a rumour gets you a glory point. Uh, completing a mission gets you a glory point. Defeating a ship, be it a player or a non-player ship, gets you a glory point. Buying a big ship gets you a glory point. You are allowed to keep gold in your treasure chest as part of your port action in your hometown only. Okay, I couldn't do it in Curacao, but I could do it if I had then docked in San Juan. I would be able to bury treasure and I'm allowed to bury up to 50 gold and each 10 will count as a, as a victory point as well. Every time you do get a glory point, with the exception of the money, so the exception of burying treasure, you will take an extra glory card and they can be specialists or they can reduce your bounty or they can be lots and lots of different things. So that is, in essence, the game of Merchants and Marauders. I hope you found this useful, and I hope I've encouraged some people to go out and really enjoy this tremendous game.